Well, greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on Shepherd's Voice Magazine YouTube channel. I hope things are going okay, and believe it or not, I'm not going to discuss the U.S. election in this uh, YouTube uh, presentation. hope you're all relieved, because I'm relieved. I'm, I, I think I've about had enough of it for, for at least a long time. Uh, in the United States, they're always having an election after one is over, another one starts within a year. So it, that just seems to w the way uh, it goes. Um, so I just want to get started here on, on the message. Um, a few weeks ago, it was after the came back from the feast, I was scrolling through the, uh, I was scrolling through um, the Facebook on my, my, on my iPhone, and I saw a, a, um, a post for um, one of the channels I, uh, you know, I'm a member of and don't re exactly remember becoming member, but a one fellow was announcing a Bible study at 7 p.m. and you just uh, click on a link and here was the topic and uh, I thought, well, you know, it looks interesting. Maybe I'll maybe I'll join this uh, uh, this this uh, Bible study at 7 p.m. So I went on my computer and I clicked the link. And very quickly, and I think that's why they call it Zoom, I was suddenly in this Bible study. It was just not hadn't quite started, and uh, I got on, and um, there was just some chit-chat, and, uh, and then the, the host said, you know, welcome, JP. I think he called me JP. It depends on what the, the icon is that you're, you are. It says, uh, well, greetings. And I said, well, these are very friendly, and, um, and I was welcomed in. We hadn't gotten started yet, uh, you know, and the, the host asked me a little bit about myself, and I just gave him some information, you know, and uh, so, and, and off we went. And, uh, you know, there was the opening prayer, and there was actually him, and it was nice, and the scripture reading in Romans, and everybody had a chance to comment, and I made a comment, and, and then it went on to the main part of the study, which was a, uh, a video message from a, um, I guess, a long-time church preacher uh, that goes back to, uh, I guess, uh, what, I, what I found out is that most of them are, are come from the this, uh, the Worldwide Church of God organization, which we often mention on this on this channel, but uh, maybe too often, but uh, it's just the background, one way or the other, and this fellow was giving a message, and um, it was about half hour long, and there was a few interruptions along the way, people would make comments. Uh, but it was about, uh, the focus was on Ezekiel 22. And it has something to do, I can't believe the full topic of the Bible study, but it is regarding the, uh, the state of, of affairs and, uh, and how what the Christians should be doing in this and, the, and, and what the nation's affairs are right now and the situation, all this kinds of stuff. So we went through Ezekiel 22. And again, here we go. Uh, I was looking to it. Well, this has very much a Anglo-Israel um, uh, leaning to it. Not only leaning, but it was based on it. And this is what this presentation is not on the subject. That subject, by the way, I just it's some background to where I'm going. And I said to the group, I said, uh, uh, just um, for transparency, I said I do not subscribe to that teaching. And, and that's what I said, just for transparency. I said, I don't subscribe to it. Well, uh, that got some kind of a reaction going. And uh, I guess I started, I don't know how, how, how it escalated a little bit. I don't know exactly how, how that came about. But I know one fellow took exception to it and said, well, how do you explain? And, and that's usually the, the thing sometimes. When they say, well, how do you explain this or how do you explain that? And I said, well, I'd be happy to answer you. And I said, and the, and, the, and the moderator uh, was very, very professional about it and said, um, uh, you know, put an end to it. And I was glad he did because I, I didn't get on that study just to talk about that. And I said, look, I've written on this subject. You can certainly go here and, and that's it. So it was very, um, I, think I, was, I think I was very polite about it. And Kim, my wife Kim was there and she said, yeah, I'm she's kind of surprised at uh, the reaction. I said, well, don't be too much. <laughs> but anyway, um, the moderator uh, ended up calling me on the Sunday, and he uh, left a voicemail. I called him back, and he 
and we had a nice chat for a while. He said that uh, he kind of wanted to uh, find out a little bit more about me, and he actually called uh, uh, Norm Edwards, who was part of this uh, uh, Shepherd's Voice ministry for close to 10 years, and Norm evidently spoke very well of me, and um, so he thought he'd give me a call, kind of get to know me a little bit, and, uh, and I thought that was nice, um, and I respect him for that. Uh, so we talked a little bit about many various things and, and his background, and he goes way back uh, to the, you know, to the, in the church from the 60s maybe, and he was a, told me how zealous he was. Um, he mentioned, um, you know, he, he fell away for a while and he came back, and and so, you know, everybody has their story, and, uh, and I, but he was, uh, he was quite nice and kind of respected, you know, my position on, on, on the, uh, Anglo-Israelism, for example, he thought maybe I was a little unbalanced in the sense that maybe I'm too focused on it. I said, well, there's only really two articles on the website, uh, as opposed to volumes of books that have been written and used to further ministries. And, you know, he admitted that this is one of the main things that brought him to, uh, he says, the truth is that, that teaching. And I, I really think, though, that's not exactly the case. I think it brings that teaching and brought brings people to certain ministries. It's actually what Jesus Christ is actually going to do with, you know, th through all that. And that's a complicated matter, which we're going to touch on today a little bit. And I got on the next Friday, and uh, you know, again, it was the same preacher, and again, it was um, based around that subject. So here. <laughs> this thing is actually, as Darren Conner Connery puts it, is quite a, much, quite, a, quite a bit in the DNA of many people uh, that have been in the church for some time. And, um, but the subject this time was um, you know, the state of the greater church of God and how this fellow feels that there's lack of love and, and among other things. And, and it ended up being you know, a lot about you know, the shepherds. You know, if you go to Jeremiah, you know, you know, I just put the quote in here. Uh, a lot of it was revolved around, Woe to the shepherds that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. And you find that in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And, and usually, you know, the folks that were on this call or on this Zoom meeting were very much, you know, don't have a very good feeling about uh, past ministry and ministers. So there's a lot of stories told. Some of them was kind of interesting. And I just listened in, and I didn't really participate in this one. And, and some folks... Uh, made some connections too in the exchange numbers because they went back to the 60s in a lot of this. And so uh, but it was, you know, interesting to listen to and, you know, everybody's got their stories, but there was a lot of complaining about the past too. And and um, so there's that. Um, so <clears throat> all this got me thinking a little bit more about um, uh, generational Church generations, for example, if you, if you don't mind the term, or generational matters. I mean, if you look in the world today, I mean, you know, there's those, they say Generation X or the Millennials and all these things. It seems that different generations have certain characteristics associated with them. And I, I'm not sure what my generation is, but um, uh, apparently that's the case. And, you know, human resource people are pretty apt at understanding the, these kinds of things, especially when it comes to the workforce. Uh, and, I, and I'd rather start looking at the church the same way, uh, looking at different generations. Um, and I, and I want to make sure I re respect all that because they had different circumstances in, for which they were living in. Um, so, you know, the Cold Wars uh, back, in the, back in the 60s, 70s, or, or 80s, I mean, affects... Um, you know, world outlooks and world views and certain tensions. Um, I, I, I'm not an expert in the subject, but I, I just think that that, is, that had a lot to do with it, especially how information was passed on um, as well, because information flows much differently today. So, um, and I, I really wanted to look, look at it a little closer, because I will say this, like, for example, uh, you know, getting on that call, I f I f uh, those two calls, I just felt, well, <clears throat> you know, um, I haven't been um, very successful in making those connections to those in the church who, or those of the same belief systems. 
I make some and some, you know, as good. This is just a generalization. It's not all the case, but making connections with those of of those generations, the multi multiple generations of uh, of the you know, Sabbath day and holy day keeping people. And so it's been a rather unsuccessful endeavor. I mean, tried it, I really put the best, my best foot forward on it. Uh, but it just always seems to run into difficulties and problems because I don't exactly uh, look at uh, a number of scriptures, namely uh, Anglicanism or the faith once delivered or other other teachings um, and uh, uh, how a church should operate and, and other matters, I mean, you name them. I just don't see that the same way, in term, especially in relation to prophecy and, and things of that nature. So, and I've been perceived as a threat as well in coming into different groups. It's like suddenly, you know, you're a threat. Well, who, do you, who do you think you are? You've got to humble this guy or and you become somewhat of a target, and somebody might be protecting their little fiefdom because they want things the way they are. So there's, it's, it's, it's a very unusual and disappointing experience, I can tell you that, because I perceive myself as coming in as a threat. And because often people do attack and discredit what they, they perceive as a threat, and, and, and that seems to be consistent uh, in, in history. So, uh, you know, as even down to certain dress codes seem to... <laughs> also have an effect on folk. I guess if you want to say the old school dress code and how people dressed in church, or they still do, I mean, that's perfectly fine. I got nothing against what you wear in terms of, of you know, putting a tie on and all these kinds of things. That's, that's perfectly fine. You can see I don't have a tie on for, I, I think, about any of these messages. I put a, put a, have a tie on. Uh, I meant a sermon of mine was actually sent to a fellow uh, out there on, Van on the Vancouver Island, he said, and uh, it was recommended to him. Why don't, you, why, don't you, why don't you watch Jim here? And this is when I, we were. This is, wasn't in this venue, but it was a uh, in a venue uh, locally here. We were renting a building and and having services, and uh, and he, he basically said, you know, what do you think um, of this message? What came back is that I was that I was. Uh, thoroughly unprofessional, uh, and I didn't have a tie in that, that one. So I guess there was, uh, that was the take, a takeaway altogether. <laughs> and it was quite a strong rejection of, of me. Um, but I think it was more because of, of being a threat. Um, but anyway, that was the case. And even recently, um, I, I have it here, I, we got a little feedback uh, on Shepherd's voice in the from from our from some email because I recommended the last the two sermons the first day and the last day um, that we have on this channel for the the feast. I sent it out on a, a Mailchimp mailing where you send out several hundred people just to say you know we're welcome to watch. And I guess one fellow did watch. Um, and this fellow wrote. He said, um, you know he take a chance and watched, he watched Aaron Connery's uh, uh, message. And um, he says here, um, being one who dresses up for Sabbath, I was a bit put off by his Don Johnson style of dress, but I listened. So if you can always, you can go to that message and he has a jacket on and, and, and a sh shirt, nice shirt with, without the collar and especially not the tie. And uh, I'll write him back when I get a chance. I mean, um, you know, uh, it's it's one of those things. So I think he quit watching at a certain point when uh, when he when the topic when it was no longer of interest to him or something like that effect. Uh, so this stuff goes on, and so this is all just mostly background um, to to what I'm talking about. And so I was thinking about this because there's a certain disappointment or disconnect, or you know, you would I really would like to make good connections with. With, with folk of, that believe the same way, but sometimes it's been, been difficult. And, and you sometimes, well, is it me or is it them? Or what is it? And just to kind of s try to look at this thing in, the, in an honest way. And of course, pray about it and just want to find, find some, some understanding about it. So does the Bible speak to this issue? When it comes down to it, 
does the Bible have something to say about what I've been talking about here? You know, I started preparing this message, and um, I found that the Word of God answers uh, you in, in a manner that uh, actually causes, causes us to think differently, uh, see the broader scope, and see Christ's provision in things, and also, and perhaps, we might find out more than we want to know. That seems to be the case, because the Bible teaches us, says, Jesus Christ says, seek and you shall find, knock and it will be open to, open to you. So this is something that we've been told to do. If you start looking into these questions and you really want to find some answers, well, you'll find, all right, you'll find something. And what, do you, what you find is, is, is a good thing. And, and if you knock, you say, well, what, if I went through this door, what will I what will I find? It'll be open to you. You just knock, ask the question. And he says, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to answer. Of course, you have to do these things. You have to seek and knock and not be afraid to do that. And so that's important. And what I found is that even the original question itself is forgotten. It really comes out of view. And that is what I have seen personally, and I think may maybe some of you would agree too. You know, and as I wrote this sermon, I actually started going in a different direction. What I wrote there, I didn't know where it was going. I really didn't. And to the point, the sermon actually goes in another direction altogether in answering the question that I've just asked, does the Bible speak to this issue? Or what I've been basically talking about here in terms of my experience with different generations of people that, uh, that uh, believe in as similar as we do, or, or as I do. And that's what happens. And I'm not really, as I said uh, some years ago, I said I'm not a linear thinker. Even in engineering, when there's a problem, I just uh, I start looking at it from the middle start working outward. I just randomly start somewhere. I don't have a very linear logical process. So in writing messages like this, I don't have an outline at all. I just, sometimes I say, well, especially when you're in writing, um, well, presentations or books or articles, you know, there's, and they, they taught us this, I remember in high school, or even then you got number one, and then you have a topic, and then you have a subsection, B, A, B, C, and maybe some small points in there, and you come back out again, and then you go about and you put your conclusion. You write your outline, and then you 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 prepare your presentation. And I suppose that's the right way of doing it, but that's not the way I personally. I'm just saying what I do personally. And so, in starting, in all honesty and and transparency, is I'm writing something. I started writing something here, and I didn't exactly know where it would go. I really, I really didn't. And so let's see if we can do this together. So um, let's go to the scripture that did occur to me, though, in, the, in that question. And let's go to Matthew 9. Back up a couple of pages for where I'm, where I'm at. And um, let's look at here at verse 14, and you'll, already, you'll know quickly what I'm about to say. But we, let's just be a little patient with it. So Matthew 9 and verse 14. Uh, and the disciples of John came to him saying, why do, we, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. So uh, there's a certain mindset that is being expressed here. I mean, here's something new. Something is new here. Jesus Christ is new. And the bridegroom is here. It's time to rejoice, not to fast, is really his main point on that. But it sparked a broader answer than just that. And he says here, Jesus said to them, can the, um, and he, then he said to them, no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment for the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, 
or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. So you're probably already thinking what, what I might be referring to here. Uh, in general, the general interpretation is, is, many would say, you know, this is the re reference to Judaism. You know, that Jesus Christ has come and then people are very set in, 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 ways of, in the ways of Judaism at the time. Um, so, but that's not really, you know, there's a broader picture here that's being said. Because it's a parable, is what he, I, at least this is the way I see it. I see it as a parable, if you don't mind. Uh, where Jesus is really capturing a broader idea of reality of what's going on and a broader idea of reality in terms of what their question was. And I'm really not surprised because he has a tendency to do that, and I'm, I'm glad he does. You know, if you practice or teach and believe something long enough, if you do this long enough, it essentially becomes who you are. It just becomes integral to your uh, thinking. And particularly here when we're thinking about a religious practice, if you would, it just becomes a part of you. And certain teachings become a part of you. And you interpret things through certain teachings. And it's just the way it is. Um, so I'm very convinced in what you, what you believe matters. And the Bible teaches us to be careful how you learn. It does. And when Jesus Christ says, believe in me, well, I guess it really does matter <laughs> what you believe and who you believe in. But if you do these things long enough, they just really become part of, you know, just integral to who you are and your behavior and how you interpret the world and reality and people. It's just the way it is. And I think it comes to a point where new wine or a fuller understanding or something new um, comes along or a refinement or even a fulfillment. As Jesus Christ was here, he was being, he was doing a fulfillment. Uh, holding, something worse can happen. I'm not entirely sure how to, how to put this, but we'll, we'll flush it out. Or holding on to the past and becoming too rigid because it says here, you know, the old way, or at least it says in another part, of, um, I think it says in Luke, well, the old way is better. It said, some new things cannot be patched onto old doctrines. Some doctrines just won't. Certain teachings and certain worldviews, they just can't, they just, certain things cannot be patched in. A new worldview or a new look at things, something fresher to say, you know, there's a better way of looking at this. And because a lot of times it just doesn't suit people's paradigm and they don't like that. It's because if you believe something long enough and teach it long enough, especially if you teach it, uh, it's hard to let go. And it becomes a difficult situation too when those, say, of an older thinking, they can keep trying to continually adapt or readapt these teachings to the changing circumstances. And that's a challenge too. So it sounds to me, and, and what I'm seeing in my experiences, it's best not to press too hard or expect too much from those who can no longer receive new things or new teachings. Because it says here, no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old wineskin, on an old garment, excuse me. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins. They just don't do it. And maybe that's the point. Because the wineskins will the wineskin will break, 
and is spilled. So it's like the worst, the former is worse than the latter. Maybe it's best to leave it alone. I am not entirely sure, but this is what it speaks to me. I've shared this point with others. But I've said, I've heard it said to me too, and this is where it's suddenly we're transitioning a little bit. If you believe error, if you've accepted and believed in error and deception through your life, and then you're suddenly given, exposed to the truth. Let's just call it that for now for the sake of understanding. So you, you've, you've been in mainstream, a Sunday keeping, Christmas person, observing these kinds of things. You're just very much a part of that. And you come into the terms and realization of perhaps the Sabbath. And, these other, and you find out all the error that you believed this whole time. You know, you get mad. I, I believed all this. Now I'm going to take in all this new understanding about all this stuff. And as my friend was taking in, he's, he was telling me um, on the phone that, you know, you got very excited and got all the literature. It was, all, it was great. And that was good. When you come into that, and it's, it's, actually, it's actually can be a very exciting thing to be first exposed to. But here's the thing. And then, finding out that even then there was plenty of deception and error in what in the new or say the, the material that you were that that you had received. That that even was not exactly true either. It's a difficult thing. So they find that deception and error is even in what they thought they found out was the truth. And who they thought their teachers were. They thought they were the real thing. But it turns out many of them, perhaps not all, I, I would hope not all, were frauds. And that's hard to accept. Especially if there is the belief that they have evangelized you and brought you in to the Sabbath-keeping understanding and the Holy Days, for example. I just say that as a broad stroke of things. And ideas of the kingdom of God. And the reason why this was said to me, because many of the things that I have brought to the attention of, say, my folks here on, on that Bible study and others and on this channel and on the magazine and over the years, is essentially, no, that, what you taught wasn't right. It's not because I have some great insight to, to say, you know, hey, follow me. That's, re that's totally ridiculous. Says, and Darren will speak the same way about much of the, that he has said and others. And people are faced with the understanding, well, you mean this was wrong? So they either look at it more carefully or they reject it. And that's really, I can't control too much of that. But that's been the challenge that I have been told. And I wasn't thinking about this in entering and writing this message. I really wasn't. I was just trying to figure out, well, what's, what's the difference, why the, why the challenges that I'm having with other generations or the challenges they're having with me. I mean, it goes both ways, right? And this is it. Not, this is, it is, I mean, this is where it really starts to come into a little bit more of a picture because I'm really not answering the first question anymore. We're heading down another direction. And I'm going to revisit that in just a minute. I'm going to revisit this dilemma that some have faced, and perhaps I'll be facing. But that's just that's the way it goes. Uh, I want to revisit it, but let's let's go to here to Luke 18 and um, verse 16. I just want to make a point in this message as well. 
Luke 18 and um, verse 16. These are scriptures we're familiar with, but I want to make a, a little broader point with them. So um, in verse 15 of Luke chapter 18, verse 15, and they also brought infants to him, that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And, I, you know, we can talk about that for a while, but really... Uh, children, I think, as, as far as I know, as far as I remember, too, are apt to take on new challenges and willing to believe new things. They're willing to believe new things. And then Matthew, back here in Matthew 21, in Matthew 21, and I've just got a note here, uh, up here in verse 15 and 16, um, this is when he was uh, entering into the temple, but just we'll pick it up from here in verse 15. When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant, and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants? You have perfected praise. So there it is again. I mean, what I'm seeing here is that the old guard, if you would, try to shut it down. Try to shut it down. And Jesus Christ made a point to them. The thing is, we need to grow with the kingdom as well. I mean, in Isaiah 9, I think it's worth just reading it. And I'm fortunately flipped there really quickly. That's great. How lucky is that? Isaiah 9. And, and I'm, I'm serious. I had no no markings here to grab. I just happened to find the right spot. Um, Isaiah, set, uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 9 and verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, shalom. So that's a, it's an increase of government of the kingdom, but also peace. So we don't want to rule that, put that point, take that point out as well. So peace, it's, it's good tidings, it's it's peace, it's safety, it's many, many other things that, that word speaks. There will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, and the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So that's important. The kingdom is growing, as prophesied by Isaiah. And we need to grow with it as well. And I think as little children, we can do that a lot easier if we have that proper mindset. We gotta grow with the kingdom forever. That's the plan, and this is what we wanna do. So I just wanna bring that into the thing, I'm gonna revisit this as well. Again, I'm, I don't often write very logically, but we're gonna come back to these points in, in a little bit. I wanna to go to Job, okay? Let's go to Job, and uh, let's find him. Here we are, Job 15. Let's take a look at what was the exchange here. I'll break into the text here. So Eliphaz is now, this is the second time that Eliphaz is taking a, a run at Job. Uh, and he's picking up the heat a bit here too, from what my understanding of what's going on. He's adding some fire in what he's saying to Job. Now Job is actually the younger of these three gentlemen, of his three friends, he is the younger one. And his friends, so his friends are all older. So I want to go here to verse 9. He says to him, What do you know that we do not know? Well, what do you know? What do you understand that is not in us? Well, what, what, Job, who do, you, what do you think, who do you think you are? Uh, and then verse 10. Both the gray-haired and the aged are among us, much older than your father, even, which is interesting. And then in verse 11, are the consolations of God too small for you and the word sp 
spoken gently with you. And that really means here to say in, verse, in the margin, reads a secret thing. And the word is a secret thing with you. What, what do you know? That you, you, you feel you know something that we don't? Some sort of secret thing to you? Well, it turns out that may be the case. That may be the case. So Job is really challenging them throughout this dialogue, and they're uh, taking him on saying, well, the old ways of understanding is what you need to get with here. You need to get with this. But that may not work here. In this case, it may not work. And something new can come out of this as something did. Something new came out of all this, through all the, what Job went through. And something new, I hope, for his three friends. And I've often found that the older generation um, tries to make things work according to an old way of thinking. This is what eventually we all do. We try to make current new circumstances work according to our old way of thinking. There's always a little bit of Pharisee in all of us, perhaps. But the reality is, especially for us, those who are in God's church, those who have been called out, and those who are experiencing or are entering, already entering into the kingdom of God, uh, the universe and the kingdom of God are growing. They're growing as I speak, and it'll be larger than when I began this sermon. And growing in perhaps ways that we are not too easy to adjust to or accept. But we need to. We need to be able to accept and adjust accordingly. That's my belief. And I want to go to Matthew now and, and try to hone on that a little bit more and try to tie in some of these loose ends that I've created. So let's go here to Matthew. Back to Matthew. Matthew 13. And let's want to read a statement. So he's done a bunch of parables and he explained a parable. Okay? And then he added some more parables. Um, and it's Matthew 52, but let's pick it up here in verse 51. Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. All right. Um, I'm going to talk about that, the new and old here, a little bit, and why he brings it up here. And that's what I wanted to look at. I was looking at this going, well, why did he say that here? I think it's unique to Matthew. Why do you say it at this, at this juncture? What is it about these parables, particularly, that have things new and old? And this is why I went, I went to this scripture, because I was thinking about the new and the old. The older generation, the newer generation. Just to thinking about this. I'm not saying one way or the other, how it, they directly tie, but it actually, again, it kind of broadens our understanding. Because in looking at this, I'm finding out more than perhaps I wanted to know, <laughs> or wanted to f at least find out. But I was knocking and uh, asking. So here we go. So how is that? Well, let's go back here in verse 34. Let's back up to verse 34. Nope, went too far. And he says here, and Matthew helps us out, all these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of of the world. And I think Matthew has really given us a little help here in terms of what Jesus summarized to them later regarding the things new and old. This is a quotation from Psalm 78 
in verse 2. It's not a direct quotation, but Matthew's saying, or not an exact quotation, but Matthew's saying this is a fulfillment. It's an adaptation to suit the circumstances is what's happening here. It's an adaptation of what the psalmist wrote in the long psalm in 78, of what he wrote there in the second verse. The thing is, there's something very ancient about the kingdom of heaven. And I've, I've talked about this before. There's something past, present, and future about the kingdom of heaven. But there is also something very, very ancient about it. You know, in Ephesians chapter 1 and 9 and 10, I've brought this up before. And I was going to break into the text very quickly in his introductory words to the Ephesians. He says, Or having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. I think this is a reference to the earliest furthest back in sight the Bible goes. It goes before Genesis 1-1, way before all that. Because he purposed in himself. He had to do it this way. He couldn't purpose outside himself. He purposed in himself because it comes from him. And it was the only way it was going to work. But he purposed in himself. And that's an important key. And I think this goes back eons, if time was before time. <laughs> And he decided to put all this into play. And when he purposed it himself, it became part of who he was. It became part of his passion. And Christ is part of that passion. It's all that. And we want to be a part of that too. So this statement here that Paul brings into play, brings into this little nugget of information, is that this doesn't happen after the fact. This is way before all that was. And we see, though, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, if you would, that's another discussion, too. We look at the kingdom, say, from that ancient, it's an ancient point of view, but also as we see, see God's work and we see history, when we see things of old, the things of old. We see it play out through the Bible from creation, the early times, the patriarchs. We see the kingdom of God play out with Israel, their time that were in slavery, and then in the wilderness, and the promised land. We see this narrative and the experiences and the voices of the prophets as we see the kingdom of God being revealed or progressing, if you, if you would. We now have Jesus Christ very much in view. We have him in the picture now, and that's our current reference. And we also have the kingdom future. So the kingdom of God is moving forward. It comes as an ancient point of ancient understanding of the kingdom. The kingdom has always been the kingdom, but there's been an ancient kingdom. There was a past, and not so past, more closely the modern than the time of Jesus Christ, and now to the time we're at today in the future. So the kingdom is growing, and it's moving forward. And yet... It's somewhat hidden, or it is hidden, but it's somehow hidden. As it is said here, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. And there are very much, there are things that are hidden. This kingdom is hidden. The kingdom of God is hidden. And yet, as we see in these parables, evil is hidden too. Indeed. And it may become a little more apparent. The offense of things that Jesus talks about in these parables in Matthew 13. And there is another message on this channel that Darren goes into much more detail on these. And uh, you can check it out in the links below if you want to reference that video. I'm not going to go into that kind of detail. So the scribes of their time, um, and then we're going to flush this out a little bit more, 
again. The scribes in their time were so wrapped up in the past that they essentially embalmed certain traditions and old erroneous ideas. They embalmed them. They just embalmed them and could not adjust to the new, the new circumstances. And they couldn't adjust to, say, the presence of Jesus Christ or maybe John the Baptist as the kingdom moved forward. So if we're going to be good scribes in the faith, we, we search into the truth. We don't chase after it. We have the truth. We just search into the truth. And that's important. And that takes effort. And we are looking at ancient and new things. This is what we do. I find that looking at, say, the ancient things, which is the Ephesians 1, 9, 10, speaks a lot to me. And I share it. I'm hopefully I've been a good scribe in that regard. And we also, a good scribe, must learn and live the truth as well. And we share and bring out of our, you know, bring out of our household things, brings out of its treasure, things new and old. What's of the most value at the most appropriate time is what I'm saying. That seems to make sense. So we need both. We need the old and the new. We need both in our household, if you would. Additionally, the scribe, the good scribe, now that we're looking at this in context, the good scribe knows that evil and offensive things are growing along with it, along with the kingdom and even in the kingdom of heaven. And that comes out of his treasure too. He knows these things. And that's a very important part of what I've always overlooked here. So the evil things, perhaps even what you thought was truth, or frauds and all that maybe you've experienced, those teachers who are not so authentic, is all part of this process for the scribe to recognize. And it's so hard to recognize it. And it's an astonishing thing. It's an astonishing thing. And if you have trouble with the difficulty under accepting what I'm just telling you, let's go back to verse 41. The Son of Man will send out of it, out his angels, and they will gather out of his out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. He will gather out of his kingdom these things that offend, or those, or those who offend, and all their offenses with them. And that's a reality. And that's a reality that perhaps I, I personally would not really want to consider, to be honest with you. And it's an astonishing thing. Did Job know some secret thing? Perhaps he did, as I mentioned earlier. Maybe there's something Job knew or was coming into picture for him, and his friends were challenging him, like, the old is only relevant here. Well, the old probably does have a relevancy. And then there's the new. But what's most appropriate for the circumstances? So I go, again, I want to go back to my friends that have entered in that, to that Bible study. I think the challenge is just that. It is just that. It's that challenge to face what I was talking about here earlier, just to kind of make sure I stay consistent. If you believe in error and deception, when you come into truth, well, that's par for the course, evidently. It may very well be par for the course. And finding out even then there's deception and error, false brethren, false teachers, those are not so authentic in your midst that you've been influenced by, perhaps. And that's just the way it is. And Jesus Christ is going to deal with it. 
But that's kind of hard to accept. It is. But evidently, Jesus Christ will send his angels and take out of everything out of his kingdom that offends. And that's kind of a reality. And again, you can go to Darren's sermon and you'll talk about that, talks about that in much more detail. New wine is perhaps a difficulty too. All this comes into play. The gospel is good news. New. It's, it's new. The gospel is new. It keeps being new. And we want it to always be new to us. Not some old message. It's still a living and growing message that should be growing in us and with us. And new teaching is often very disturbing. The gospel was very disturbing for the people at that time. It came in and disturbed a lot of folk. Good or bad, it just disturbed people. And old wine has goodness. It absolutely does. But so does new wine. It has goodness too. And we want to be able to accept it. Because new wine is fit to drink. It absolutely is. So new is good. And we want to embrace and grow with the kingdom. And there's certain thing, realities we may have to accept along the way. We just have to. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Explanation point. So new is a good thing. New is something to celebrate. New wine is perfectly fine. <laughs> I want to go to the book of Revelation. As we wrap up here. <clears throat> Way up here in the book of Revelation. You know, in the book of Revelation, we hear that we, I believe, we get a new name. And we sing a new song, perhaps. It's new. In verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 21, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. So we saw here also a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. In verse 4, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he said, and he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. You know, I've said God started this in you know, other messages. That God wanted more God. It's the only way it can work. It's the only way it's going to work. But God wants more of himself. That's really what it boils down to. Because God is growing. God himself is growing. And perhaps God himself is experiencing new things. And I think so. And why not? We want to grow with him in the best way we can. And that's up to you. So brethren, I hope to leave you on that, on a, that positive note. And um, thank you for watching. Uh, be sure to make any comments if you wish or write to us at uh, svminfo at shepherdsvoicemagazine.org and uh, be sure to like it if, if you liked it, this message. And uh, as Darren says all the time, tell a friend. And uh, thank you for watching. Uh, we'll, we'll see you next time.